I should say, I'm not going to light a candle for this, but I could easily do so, that we are blessed with an innovation this morning, that Renee and I have decided that the most ecologically responsible candles and chalice we could use are uh, beeswax. Now, beeswax is expensive, but Renee has taken on, as part of her role as our aesthetics and worship uh, uh, person, <laughs> steward, steward uh, to actually mold these candles in their dishes. So we're going to see how this works. We're hoping it works as well as we think it will. And Renee, thank you for taking the trouble to reorganize our uh, candle lighting. Well, I will write a, light a candle for that. Because I don't know yet if they'll even light, but yeah. joys and concerns. Thank you, Margaret. Three readings this morning. The first by the philosopher Richard Rorty. You have to describe the country in terms of what you passionately hope it will become, as well as in terms of what you know it to be now. You have to be loyal to a dream country, rather than one to which you wake up every morning. In the second reading, William Butler Yeats, in dreams, begin responsibility. And then a third reading, which is longer, from the uh, introduction to uh, Michael Kazin's recent book, American Dreamers, which is an assessment of the impact of, uh, from his point of view, the radical left since uh, abolitionism. Dr. Zeus, is that it? Dr. Seuss? Dr. Seuss. I read these books to my kids. Uh, that turns out to have been his middle name. His name was Theodore Seuss Geisel. Dr. Seuss, who had neither an MD nor a PhD, got his start in the cartoon business, but soon turned his talent to political purposes. Seuss was a man of the popular front, that broad left vessel anchored by the Communist Party. For two years in the early 1940s, he was a regular cartoonist for the left-wing New York City Daily, PM. After the war, Seuss began to produce children's books that used witty rhymes and fluid, fanciful drawings to convey the best principles and some of the fondest aspirations of the left. He kept this up until his death in 1989. The books, which have sold millions of copies, include The Sneetches, A Brief for Racial Equality, Yertle the Turtle, A Satire of Fascist Tyranny, The Lorax, A Plea to Save Nature from Corporate Greed, The Butter Battle Book, a fable in support of nuclear disarmament, and Horton Hears a Who, a parable about the need to act against genocide. His most famous book, The Cat in the Hat, while less overtly political, introduced a sublimely destructive feline who did his bit to inspire the counterculture of the 1960s. Seuss made great children's literature out of the essential critique and vision of the left. He married the ideal of social equality to the principle of personal freedom. As one journalist put it, in his books, might never makes right, the meek inherit the earth, and pride frequently goeth before a fall, usually a pratfall. Seuss cracked crafted messages with more wit, more hipness, more color than any movement activist I've ever known. And few of his readers appreciated that he was illustrating a coherent and quite political worldview.
I remember back when John F. Kennedy was assassinated, uh, a ministerial student friend of mine uh, immediately sat down to write a sermon about it in place of the one he had uh, posted in the, the church newsletter in which he was an intern. But his supervisor advised him, no, he said, go ahead with the sermon you've posted. This is a political event, not a religious one. And folks will be expecting to hear the sermon you've announced. That was bad, bad advice. Of course, the congregation came that following Sunday morning hungry to hear this national trauma in which they were so emotionally involved, sorted out and interpreted in, in liberal <coughs> faith perspective. And they felt my student minister friend had left them twisting in the wind. Well, it seems obvious now, but all of us at the time were instructed by his experience some months back in, in the time, at the time of the Tucson shootings, I, I set aside the sermon I had announced to you in the, in the newsletter and talked instead about that horrific event, and I've done this often over the years. But I learned another lesson from my colleague's unhappy mistake as well, born of his uh, supervisor's suggestion that Kennedy's assassination was a political event and not a religious one. As if politics and religion could really be separated. This comment points up an issue which has challenged us, uh, challenged universalist, Unitarian Universalism over the years. Last winter, I lighted a candle for the public employees in Wisconsin, whose reactionary governor is determined to strip them of workers' rights gained over many decades of hard effort. Same thing is happening in other states where reactionary officials see their opportunity in this economy to destroy unions. You're, you're all aware of these, these events. And I was prompted to light a candle, not only because Lily and I are residents of Wisconsin and, and love its progressive history, but also because my daughter and son-in-law have both been Wisconsin public employees for many years. My daughter Margaret's a school teacher on Washington Island, and her husband Kirby is a state park superintendent. Both have been active members of their unions, and their right to collective bargaining has now been stripped from them not to mention possible reductions in the benefits they've earned over many years of service, which, since I lighted that candle last year, has forced Lydia's dad, uh, my granddaughter's dad, um, I've got her on my mind this morning because she, uh, she called with concern about this, it's forced him to retire early, really at the height of his career. The new governor and, and legislature, which just a few weeks earlier had cut taxes on the rich by $117 million, then claimed that Wisconsin can no longer afford to honor its long-standing benefits promises to its employees. Well, I'm concerned also because you may not realize it, but I'm an old union guy myself, a former member of the American Federation of Musicians. Now, now there's a Tough, tough bunch of union roustabouts, right? <laughs> Is that right, Pete? Uh, yeah, boy. Uh, but and also, hang on to your hats. I'm also a Chicago uh, Teamster, uh, was and, and still carry an inactive card. So I fervently believe, you know, that collective bargaining is not a matter of law, but a human right. After I lighted that candle last winter, Mike Wolf stood up out of the blue. I uh, had no idea that he had this interest or concern, and announced that he and some others had already planned to head up to Madison the next morning, President's Day, to join the demonstration uh, there. How that refreshed my spirit. Someone not from Wisconsin, but right here in this congregation in Illinois. Solidarity forever. Of course, the concern 
in all this is that hanging out with Unitarian Universalists, listening to our lighting of candles of joys and concerns, for example, one can easily get the idea that liberal religion equals liberal politics. In fact, just before that very Sunday service, uh, Rebecca had asked me whether a political conservative could really be at home in a Unitarian Universalist church at all. Well, obviously, I certainly hope so. But her question, Rebecca's question, was not so easy to answer as our, you know, as, as liberal political and social views do clearly dominate our congregations. Just notice the way I've described the Wisconsin situation and how just my saying it, the way I've said it, exposes me to the charge of, of taking a partisan position. Probably doesn't help for me to tell you that I'm personally so far to the left politically that I've never been comfortable with the Democratic Party. <laughs> and, and I sound like a lot of Unitarian Universalists. So how can I maintain that our churches are equally supportive of political conservatives? Well, there is this principle that a truly liberal religious perspective both sees political issues as matters of primary religious concern and at the same time transcends politics altogether, rising to a kind of universal solidarity. The environmental crisis is a good example of this, in which the very future of life on Earth and the Earth itself may hang precariously in the balance. We may politicize this issue as, uh, and, and, and sadly, alarmingly, it is being politicized today along partisan lines. But the metaphysical principle, if you will, of reverence for life calls us to a higher perspective. Of course we will argue about any particular issue. In fact, I have a dear friend, a, a retired distinguished professor of paleontology from the University of Chicago, a very thoughtful and informed man who believes that there is no environmental crisis. But this higher perspective of reverence for life claims him nevertheless as a serious citizen. He understands that he and I must address this issue in good faith, address it together, bringing our arguments and evidence forward on various sides in order to reach the truth of the matter. Note that a critical element of this higher attitude is that while he thinks I'm wrong about global warming, he acknowledges that I may be right, as I do about him, in which case he and I must work together to figure it out for the common good before it may turn out to be too late. But back to Wisconsin with its remarkable progressive history. This history cut across partisan lines. In fact, some of you may not realize that it, it came to a considerable extent directly out of Wisconsin's Republican Party. Fascinating history, and it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. The assertion of workers' rights, for example, with the benefits they gave all of us, like, like weekends, for instance. These rights and benefits were hard won over many years at great cost, including the loss of many lives in, in Wisconsin, in the mines in Kentucky, West Virginia, and the sweatshops in New York's Lower East Side, in Chicago and Cleveland steel mills, in Detroit's auto plants. I could go on. The brutal attacks on workers fed by big money and big power, workers who had nothing to bring to bear on their situation but their determination to stand together. If this isn't a human right, I don't know what is. It's so easy in the face of it, in the face of the resistance, to get angry, to reduce the opposition to the enemy. But you know, you're focusing on Wisconsin and then Egypt erupts and we say, wow, Muslims are struggling for a free society. 
And then your daughter emails you the latest update from Wisconsin. Then someone sends you a video clip of demonstrations in Iran and someone else the latest chart of projected global warming. And a member of your congregation who has no connection to Wisconsin says he's going up to Madison on President's Day to join the demonstration there. And a much bigger picture begins to emerge. And you see that what is at stake is not you on one side and this governor guy on the other, but the human condition itself, the future of the earth, and a larger vision of things which binds us together, claims us to work together, insists that we do so. And I say this is a religious vision. This is a vision of the spirit that holds us all to account, not in Madison or the Middle East, but in the world, or as a theologian might put it, in the very existence itself. It helps to understand that every issue, absolutely every issue, is ambiguous and complex. For example, as I've mentioned before, I'm caught between my personal pacifism and my political consent to a just war. I know that personally I could not kill another human being under any circumstances. The Nazi soldier in the trench across from me is not my enemy. On the other hand, his country's assault on the free world must be stopped. A further complication of my personal pacifism is what it will cost others. Some uh, pacifists, some Quakers in particular, fought in the Civil War and have fought in other wars since. All wars they oppose in principle for the conscientious reason that if they did not, someone else would have to die in their place. Their motive was their commitment to their suffering brothers and sisters, their solidarity with suffering humanity. So every issue is complex, every issue is ambiguous, and therefore subject to disagreement and debate in the context of a higher vision to which we all are bound. In our reading this morning, we learned that Dr. Seuss was a leftist, and each of his famous books was a leftist lesson. But was it? Was it? Our racism, fascist tyranny, genocide, nuclear holocaust, environmental destruction, really only leftist concerns? I mean, parents across the political spectrum, left and right, read these stories to their kids, nodding their heads, learning themselves from them. If conservatives discover that Dr. Seuss thought his stories were describing a leftist worldview, should they take it back? Or should Dr. Seuss have taken back his stories when he discovered, as he did, that they were being read by everyone, left and right, not as leftist stories, but as lessons within a higher vision that embraces us all in a common struggle for human unity and a sustainable creation? liberal religion must understand that it represents this higher vision, this, what Rorty, Rorty called, this, this loyalty to a dream country. It's this higher loyalty that actually works to humanize us, all of us, that makes it even possible for liberals and conservatives to have a conversation. And it's this overarching vision, this transcendent dream of what humanity and the world might be that the liberal church seeks to cultivate and must seek to cultivate. And with this, uh, with, within this dream, every particular concrete issue, you name it, abortion, gay marriage, 9-11, the Arab Spring, Libya, Afghanistan, global warming, the national debt, corporate power, collective bargaining on and on. Every issue is discussable and must be held to be discussable by everyone who claims to be a participant in free religion and a proponent of democracy.
Meanwhile, we of the democratic faith are charged, are bound to cultivate that dream itself, that dream of loyalty, that loyalty to a dream country, a dream world, just as Dr. Seuss cultivated it in his, uh, in his delightful, famous, and uh, I think profoundly influential stories. Let's join together now in some words of aspiration and some moments of silent meditation. Nothing worth doing is completed in our lifetime, said the great theologian Reinhold Niebuhr. Nothing worth doing is completed in our lifetime. Therefore, we are saved by hope. Nothing true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we are saved by faith. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we are saved by love. No virtuous act is, is quite as virtuous from the standpoint of our friend or foe as from our own. Therefore, we are saved by the final form of love, which is forgiveness. <clears throat> <clears throat> 